Hi everyone and hi cameras. I am uh, Matt Welch, Editor-in-Chief of Reason Magazine. Um, welcome to our uh, little hovel here in, uh, in Los Angeles. We're here to talk about Video Game Nation, which is an awesome uh, issue of the magazine that's fresh out uh, on the stands here. I hope that uh, y'all go to our special landing page where I think you can actually even play a game, although I know, understand so little about video games that I'm not sure if that's actually true. Um, I'm here with uh, Tracy Fullerton, who's a game designer and academic, and Craig Allen, who's the CEO of a game company. We're going to talk about how video game market has uh, changed American life and where it's going, and we're going to take some questions and we're going to have a good time. Uh, I want to start this whole thing off, though, by getting a sense of the room. How many of the 43 people in this room uh, play video games, let's say, once a week? Okay, so around half, a little bit less. Uh, how many once a month, at least? And that includes the once a week people. Come on. <laughs> How many are unfamiliar with mathematics? Um, <laughs> yeah. And how many people are like my dad and think that we're talking about game shows tonight? <laughs> um, that's awesome. So I'm in that latter group, uh, which made it particularly fun and rewarding for me to edit this issue of uh, reason because we have a lot of people on staff, including Scott Shackford. Scott, are you in this room right now? Hey, there he is. I want to give special credit for Scott uh, for this issue. Scott uh, probably has played as many video games today as I have in the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, he really helped wrote the cover story, a profile on Representative Jared Paulus, who's really the first kind of video game congressman and a very interesting libertarian Democrat uh, out of Colorado. Uh, and a lot of Scott's thinking went into this issue, so I just want to acknowledge the great man. Uh, but we, so part of my interest in this whole concept was, hey, I don't know this stuff that's going on and is, uh, and is uh, transforming American culture. And I learned all kinds of crazy things in the, in the process of doing this issue, such as video game companies employ economists to study how people interact with one another and how they deal with currencies. And these economists will tell you, this is the best economics that we can do. Forget macroeconomics. We can actually measure everything here, uh, and we can. And it's exposing that real-world economics doesn't really work. Uh, we found Reason Root polling here. Emily Eakins is hopefully in the room as well. Uh, she did some special polling on this, looking at the attitudes of people who play games frequently, and they turn out to be to have much more broad sense of tolerance, of wanting, uh, thinking that individual freedom is a is a core value. All kinds of issues like that uh, that came to the forefront when learning this. So I will stop blathering, but I just want to, for all of you to people who are like my father and myself and don't understand video games at all, hopefully we will leave you with a sense that it's a pretty interesting topic. It's changing culture, it's changing politics uh, even, and it's certainly changing business. So I'm starting with uh, Craig Allen here, who is the CEO of Spark Unlimited, not Sparks Unlimited. I keep going to the, uh, to the rock band here. Uh, Spark uh, Unlimited uh, is famous for Call of Duty, Finest Hour, and also Turning Point, Fall of Liberty, which hopefully we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, Craig, I wanted you to just sort of give us a sense uh, from uh, us dumb outsiders. How big is the video game industry? Compare it to other things that we intuitively have a sense of, like, say, the movie industry. What is the size and scope of this thing now? It's big. Really, really big. <laughs> that helps those math people that we were talking to earlier. So that's the basic uh, piece of the equation. Actually, the game industry is really exciting because uh, when I started back in the early 90s and you know when the arcades were around in the 80s, it was much more about an enthusiast. It was um, somewhat social, but kind of a niche market. And in the living room, there's only kind of so many people you can reach. And in a computer or a PC, there's so many people you can reach. But now, everybody has a computer in their pocket. We're walking around with these mobile devices. We're about to start having wearable technology. And as technology becomes ubiquitous and we have connections, games are just a natural outgrowth of an ability to socialize. So I think that as much as I like to look at video games as a category, and we're on our way to being, depending on what numbers you want to use, a $100 billion industry or, a, you know, it's, it's big. I think that thinking about video games as a game actually limits what we're really doing in terms of our impact on the world right now. Because games are things that are just about having social currency. So you can talk about a game as entertainment, 
but you can also talk about something as a construct for how you live your life, whether that's being better at um, fitness programs, whether that's having a LinkedIn profile that has a status bar that shows you how complete your profile is. So it's, game, it's how we gamify our lives in addition to well, actually playing. How we quantify our lives, right? Games are about statistics. Games are about data. Games are about understanding relative value in terms of your performance. So as we start to be able to track everything, um, you know, it's the game of life. Uh, this is a good segue into Tracy. Tracy is not only a game designer, which we're going to talk about a little bit, uh, but she also runs the Annenberg School of, what is this? It's actually the uh, <laughs> uh, USC School of Cinema uh, Television has an interactive media and games division. Yes, it is very long. Yes. Uh, so, um, and I'm the chair of the interactive media and games. I mean, first of all, like, you're an academic who studies video games. Do half of your colleagues just roll their eyes at you when you walk down saying this is a legitimate academic discipline? Well, so I actually come, uh, I came to academia uh, from uh, the game industry. So I'm sort of a transplant. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago when we started the program, that, that was exactly the case, is that people would kind of go, we, st we, we teach what? <laughs> And um, you know, as we became more established, and we had a lot of success stories coming out of the program, a lot of uh, entrepreneurial students starting their own companies. Um, one of <coughs> our, our the companies that has come out in the past ten years um, won Game of the Year last year, and multiple uh, honors uh, have gone to a number of other games. So you start to see students coming out of the program who are uh, innovative, they're, you know, they're, they're savvy, they're creative, they're able to put businesses together and make um, kind of amazing uh, you know, product that's getting out there and, and changing the way that people think about not only what games are, but how they're made. Well, let's talk about what, what are we doing when we play games besides obviously you know, punching prostitutes and stealing people's cars. What are, what are people actually engaging in and, and doing when they're playing games? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the thing about games is that they're pretend, right? Okay, the first, the first thing is, is that other than this, this, this quantification, they also are, they're a safe place where we can practice things and we can rehearse ideas. We can say, do I want to punch the prostitute? What would happen if I punched the prostitute, <laughs> right? And we sort of test those boundaries like we did when we were a kid, right? I mean, that is, uh, uh, you know, in many ways where the, the, the play instinct evolved um, as a part of learning, right? And, and humans play when they're young. And, you know, we, not so much when we get older, but what's interesting is as we, we have to continue evolving now in this society where technology is changing and our, we have to be more adaptable longer into life, play has become more important to us longer into our lives, I think. So I, I think that play instinct is the core of what we're engaging in. We're learning to test boundaries. We're learning to, to create constructs in our mind about what's going to happen if. And then we we'll go out and practice those things, master them. Now, is this replacing? Maybe we're not doing the same thing in the playground that we used to. We're not punching as many prostitutes as we used to in the playground. Or is this, is this replacing behaviors and, and even kind of creating a safer place for certain types of experimentation than we had 20 years ago? I think it's extending those behaviors. And I think that there's still always going to be a place for one-on-one, -on -one, in person. You know, we, it, you know, humans love to be together and to like you know, physically and interact. It's actually one of the reasons you're seeing games extending out of the, the computer into real life. A little bit like what Craig is saying about quantifying your life and being able to play in social networks. So yes, it's great to um, take perhaps unsafe behaviors, things like, and, and maybe not great behaviors like punching prostitutes and put them on the screen. But then it's also great to extend back into real life and say, hey, I can, I can walk more steps than you today. Let's see, right? And, and bring those behaviors back into our social networks. And Craig, how do you, you were going to follow up. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that's really the core of it, which is games are about giving you a place that's safe to play. In so much in our life, we don't touch this, don't do that, don't go there, don't do that. It's all about the don'ts. And you go into a game environment and you can experiment. You can, you can try things out. You can try a different persona. You can try a different style of play. Yes, there's maybe a construct within the game that incentivizes you to do certain things for the best results. But that freedom allows you to discover. And I think that, that you're starting to see some interesting data from researchers saying that even violent video games actually decrease the aggression and hostility of the players because it's cathartic. It's a way of releasing tension 
because they get to kind of, you know, play out these things that they wouldn't do in real life. Wouldn't do it, yeah. Now, obviously, there's always going to be outliers that have a hard time separating real from fantasy, and whether it's a movie or a book or a comic book or a game, there's, it becomes a dumping ground for this is, this is creating issues. Um, there are people that just have issues. But for the bell curve, the middle of it, um, it actually, I think, is, is, is really positive. And we're seeing crime rates come down and a lot of um, things that some people are drawing corollaries to people being able to act out in a, in a safe way, irresponsible behavior. There's a great uh, piece in here by Jesse Walker about kind of a history of moral panics about games that people play, whether it's poker. It's picked in New York City, they were smashing pinball machines with sledgehammers yeah. in the 70s. Yeah. There's so many things to smash pinball. in New York in the 1970s. Yeah, pinball machines <laughs> in the 1970s. It all had a pinball comment. came from gambling. Yeah. It became a skill-based game to avoid legislation because it was a gambling system. Bumpers. And then they, they added the flippers so that they could get around certain gambling laws. See, I did not know this. <laughs> Flipper history here. Um, talk a little bit about the way that uh, the industry is organized right now. Is it a blockbuster bu industry the same way that Hollywood has become a blockbuster industry? How does, what constitutes this $100 billion or whatever it is thing? Uh, you know, I think, I think it's a, it, our industry, like many media industries, like many businesses today, I think, are becoming incredibly um, stratified between the blockbusters, the big margin, the high quality experience that people will pay for, and Walmart or you know free to play or um, reality TV. Tell my dad what free to play is. Okay. <laughs> so um, free to play. That's you like how I use my dad as a, it's his fault, not mine, but I don't understand what free to play is. So uh, basically, we used to have kind of a one size fits all pricing in the industry. So you'd go to Walmart, you'd buy like a forty dollar game or a fifty dollar game. You'd take it home, you'd play it, and that was the transaction. Now that we have digital delivery, now that you have mobile apps, you have more accessibility to content, um, people are trying different pricing models. Everything from you pay for the app for like $3.99 or $1.99 to take it for free, but if you want to get other levels or you want to have other characters or you want other elements or features, you pay incrementally. So it's free to play um, to a point of monetization. And it's another area where the game industry, like, like television and, and many industries, are finding new parameters to reach the audience in a way that they feel comfortable. So you have you know, pay and no ads. You have free and ads. You have subscription-based, limited access, pay-per-view. All these different formats of pricing are now coming into the game industry. And um, it's a big change, because we didn't used to have that. Um, you know, we had online kind of adver gaming type things, but um, we're now seeing all new models come out, which are pretty exciting. And you have entire parallel universe filled with hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people who are starting businesses in that universe. You're scaring yeah. me with all this stuff. Now, tell me, yeah. tell me what the hell is going on over there. Well, basically, we're playing a game within the game, right? Because this is all a simulation. Right. So, yeah. This? You aren't really in this room. Because <laughs> right. we all saw the Matrix, right? We know that this isn't real. Um, no, but, th but, that's, but that's essentially what we're doing, right? Is we're, we're moving further and further into immersive reality. And if you see things like Oculus Rift um, or these other technologies, like the Google Glass is a first step, you're going to be able to um, go further and further into a believable recreation of, of, a, of a reality. And, and I think the bigger question is, you know, what happens when that reality is more compelling than the one we live in? Um, we're already starting to see some, some early edge cases of people not eating, um, starving themselves, um, dying at a computer terminal because they're so immersed in the, the, the fantasy that they don't want to leave. And, um, you know, whether it's a game or whether it's just work, look at work patterns, right? You used to have a, a job at an office and you would leave. Now you take your work with you. And there's this social pressure, like, I sent you a text message. Why didn't you respond? It's been three minutes. <laughs> um, because I don't live with my technology all the time. But the expectation grows. So at what point do you stop having control over your own life because the demands of your virtual life take over. The way that you smile when you say that really sends a chill down my spine. Uh, <laughs> now, your world that you're creating is obviously Walden Pond and Henry David Thoreau. Talk a little bit about what you're doing. 
Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring this up um, because I think that uh, one of my reasons for beginning this project was to um, find a kind of balance, right, for, my, for myself um, and to uh, explore how you might create a game that would um, not be so compulsive to play, would be a beautiful and interesting and compelling experience, but one that would actually point you back towards a better sense of balance between what you know, uh, sort of you must do to survive, and um, what you might do to sort of make your life better. And and uh, so this is a game where basically you play out the experiment that that Thoreau set for himself at Walden Pond to live this simple, basic existence and kind of bring down. Uh, his 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 life to its bare essence. So you he lays out what he, he thinks are the sort of um, you know bare components of life to survive in, in this this climate, as he says, um, and that's food, fuel, shelter, and clothing. And that's um, so the basis of our simulation. You could actually probably find more modern models of what per person needs to survive, but we decided to go with what Thoreau had had laid out. Um, and so you have to caretake these basic needs. Um, on the other hand. If you just caretake them, your life will be um, somewhat dismal in, in this, this rich uh, 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 world that we've built. Um, if you are able to um, balance between the basic needs and the sort of, uh, you know, these more ephemeral needs, the, uh, a discovery around uh, the pond and, and interacting with nature and doing some of the really interesting uh, scientific tasks that he set for himself, for example, um, then you will ha you'll achieve this balance. And the, and the world itself responds to that balance and becomes a, a richer experience for you. How do you create this stuff? I mean, that sounds phenomenal to me, but how do you create it at the kind of granular mm. level of the universe of, you know, how, you know how It's a great question, actually, yeah. and, and, and I think that, um, you know, when you're talking about, for example, getting into a world of full immersion, it's important to recognize that every game is an abstraction. And it is a simulation, and as simulations are that you choose what it is that you're simulating. You, it is not actually the real world. It, it, we've made very specific choices. There are like you know just over 200 um, animal species and plant species in the world, and those were chosen by going through the text of Walden and seeing. We actually you know did a coding of it, seeing which ones the row mentions the most, which ones he finds the most interesting, which he, if he describes them at great length. Um, and so it isn't a objective look at, uh, say, Walden today or even Walden of the time. It is a translation into a playful form of what he wrote in his book. Although what I think is really interesting is, it, for me, the game designer is a behavioral modification engineer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because what they're really doing is incentivizing you to run down a certain path and seek a reward that they want you to seek. You might have lots of choice. You might not have any choice, but they try to design it so that you seek out the situation and the results without you even really knowing it intuitively to discover what they want you to learn. So when you're talking about what you're teaching, you, you've created this beautiful world, but, but actually what they're trying to teach you is live a better life. Yes, outside right? of this world, but, it, but, but by understanding, by coming to the conclusion that right. you have to achieve this balance in world, I'm hoping for some sort of transference to the real world. But I would imagine also there might be a tension among players. They want more and more control over their future, including their choices, mm -hmm. right? And they want to be able to create their own sets of architecture, not just deal with your paternalistic choice architecture, mister. Um, and so do you get punished if you actually no, in fact, you know, in, in this game, by, just in this particular game, we actually talked about that. So you can become what we call a Walden millionaire, which... Um, uh, <laughs> a condo you, and a big skyscraper. You, you, and, you basically you know, can grow your bean pad. field and sell, sell the... You can take odd jobs and you can uh, buy a fine fancy suit and you can upgrade your little house and yeah, you can totally become ridiculous. a Walden millionaire. <laughs> but you will never have this sort of rich experience that I'm talking about. You will have all those other things, right? And that is, that is a way of winning. Right, um, but you will never find uh, you know all of, there. There are all these jewels of experiences that are in the world that you won't actually find. But but that's where I go back to a game <coughs> is a construct of rules for a purpose that you incentivize people to accomplish. Right. So when we talk about a game as a simulation, um, you can think of that as like a video game, like simple, simplistic, like Space Invaders or Asteroids or you know, cause effect, life, death, action, reaction. 
but it's also more broadly, it's, it's the rules that we live our lives by, right. right? It's the construct of if you have a job and you want to get a promotion and you want to get a raise and you want to get a house and you want to have a family and you want to send them to a good school, how do you get into university? That's become a whole game. The university game is, it's is kind of dazzling funny. and it's not very well designed. We actually made a game. <laughs> One of the other games that I'm working on is a game about how to get into university because it is a game, yeah. right? And so, and there's so many kids out there who come from families, at, you know, or are in schools where the counselors are disappearing like, you know, crazy at this point. And so we said, well, hey, let's make a game that teaches them how to play this game. Since you only get to play this game once, right. wouldn't it be neat if you could rehearse that? and learn how to play this game. I like that. So. Well, one of your games uh, is sort of uh, uh, set people back to, uh, is it just before World War II? It's kind of a, a revisionist uh, history or choices that you can have there. Is there something inherent to uh, games, kind of in the way that I think uh, there's something inherent to science fiction mm -hmm. that makes you think kind of big picture, this is how the world works or doesn't work kind of questions um, and therefore, and this is uh, largely for this audience out here, it uh, forces people to ask essentially libertarian questions. Like, what is the role of the state? What is the role yeah. of you know, the use of force and these types of things? Is there something inherent to the video game world? I, I think that, that for, our, for the game industry, um, we started out as, as a very kind of diverse, really wide creative spectrum industry with arcades and, and lots of experimentation. And when we kind of went through this home console push and a push to um, high prices, retail-oriented, package media, um, things became kind of collected around blockbuster entertainment. So I think the kind of games that you're seeing a lot of are the ones that, much like Hollywood, work for a wide audience, are things that work really well on a poster, that get people interested, angry, emotionally reacting to the topic in a way that gets them invested. And a lot of those, I think, become socially relevant because it's what we're dealing with, right? So um, for us, with, with Turning Point versus Call of Duty, um, Call of Duty for us was, uh, at the time, our team had been working on Medal of Honor and doing a lot of things about finding honor and glory in World War II as kind of the greatest generation and these themes of what do you fight for as a soldier. Call of Duty was about, as contrast, was the one that we did, um, a, a bunch of different soldiers from different nationalities um, basically following orders, trying to find out where's that line between personal responsibility, obligation, and duty to country because you may not want to do what you're doing, but you have a duty to serve. And then with Turning Point, it was looking at a flip on the soldier and saying, well, what happens when the war comes to you? As, as an American um, in New York, what if there was this alternate timeline and D-Day basically happened here, a citizen's choices are very different than a soldier's choices. They don't necessarily follow the same logic or the same path, and they have to find their own reasons to what they fight for and why they fight, and propaganda becomes a big thing. So um, for me, you know, there was a lot of themes that were coming out of 9-11 and, and what was happening in our country in terms of you know, where do we draw that line between safety and personal freedom? Where do we think about as a citizen, what our role is to, to temper and, and work with or work against our government. And um, so anyway, I think that, that in um, the, the kind of big game oriented products, whether you look at current Call of Duty, um, you know, you're finding these reflections of the times we're living in because they have the broadest appeal. But what's exciting on a, on a creative level is what's happening now in the, in the emerging markets with mobile, tablet, digital. Um, we're back to a really creative, verse, diverse spectrum. So you're finding lots of little games that can explore really, really small topics like, you know, I want to play as a plague, which is, you know, a great little app on the App Store where you play a virus and try to kill all life on Earth. Um, <laughs> not something that would necessarily be sold at Walmart, but, um, but it's, a, it's a great little game, right? I mean, you feel really bad when humans survive. You're like, darn it, I'm so close. Um, but you know, whether it's that, or like there's a game that uh, Monument Valley, which mm. takes uh, MC Escher prints basically as inspiration and plays with perspective and allows you to try to um, solve puzzles by making impossible situations. So uh, I think it's a really exciting time for games and whether it's for entertainment or like we're talking about um, with real world applications, 
uh, a friend of mine has a leaf and uh, and they took it into the dealership to be serviced and they came back and said hey congratulations and she's like what well you're the most fuel efficient driver in California <laughs> because if you keep the leaf in the little bars it's like that's maximum fuel efficiency and so now she wants to be the best fuel efficient driver in the US right and she's like religiously driving that car it became a game right it's a car but now it has data and feedback that allows you to improve performance and I think the silver lining and the hope for the world is we generally want to be better and if we can give people better feedback and better data and better access to each other to coach mentor encourage um, we can make a better world. I want to thank you both, Tracy Fullard and Craig. Incredible uh, learning process here tonight. So we'll give them a round, warm round of applause. Uh, I'll just sign off for the purposes of Reason TV. For Reason TV, I am Matt Welch. And uh, good night and Godspeed. And uh, go drink. Have fun while we're still here. <laughs>